Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, help yourself to cookies if you are hungry at all, or if you're not hungry. Um, my name is Fritz Klasner. I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager with Office of Mauna Kea Management, and this is uh, another of our monthly Mauna Kea Speaker Series talks on uh, some of the scholarship that happens on or about Mauna Kea. Um, it's a, the speaker series is a partnership between uh, Office of Mauna Kea Management, the Emilo Astronomy Center, and the UH Hilo Physics and Astronomy Department. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Susan Cornell. Susan is, besides uh, amongst the many hats that she wears, she's on the Environment Committee for the Office of Mauna Kea Management. The, uh, that Environment Committee advises our Community Management Board on environmental concerns, the particularly the natural resource program that Jessica Kirkpatrick and myself constitute the majority of the staff. Uh, we sometimes have interns in that, but it's mostly Jessica and myself in terms of helping guide our work um, and otherwise speak to and help sort of represent the community about environment, environmental concerns on Mauna Kea. Uh, but, and that's the universe for the university managed lands, which are mostly predominantly what's above about 12,000 feet. Uh, but Susan is also the, I don't know the exact term, but the director of the Institute of Pacific Island Forestry, the U.S. Forest Service office, which is just up the street here on the uphill side of Comahana Street. Um, she's the director up there, and she's also, as the first slide here says, the science lead of the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest, which has units both in Laupahoehoe and in Pu'uva'a. And without further ado, because I really am here to learn about the experimental tropical forest, I think this idea started back, of, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, because I thought we were going to do a 10-year anniversary <laughs> talk, and then by the time she submitted her, her slide, or hey, her talk title, like it was a lot of, <laughs> well, I started with talking with Rick, her, oh, okay. the predecessor of the uh, <laughs> Institute of Pacific Island Forestry. It wasn't you, it was me. <laughs> that took a realized it was a year or a year and a half before I actually followed or followed up and not a couple of weeks or a couple of months like I thought it was. So anyway, uh, a slightly belated 10, 10 year anniversary uh, talk for the experimental tropical forest. Um, and with that, Susan, um, Jessica has a lay for you. And again, oh, thank you for thank coming you. tonight. Appreciate it. Great, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. And it's great to see a lot of familiar faces here. And I'm just curious about who would come to a talk about an experimental forest? So I just want to know in this room who actually knows about the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest. Just show our hands. A little bit, no, so really, no. So you're really here to learn what it is. So that's cool. Um, it's been a big part of my life for the last 11 years, so I'm happy to share this with you today. So um, let's move on here. And I'm going to talk about some of the exciting science we're doing, but first I'll probably maybe bore you a little bit with some of the administrative functions that had to take place to get this experimental forest established. Oh, there we go. Okay, so experimental forests are part of the USDA Forest Service, which is a national program. Um, and there's 80 experimental forests across the US. And this program started in 1908, I think the first one was in Arizona. And um, they're basically areas that were set aside to help resource managers um, carry out uh, research that's important for them to manage these landscapes. And at the time they were started, it was primarily like silviculture research, you know, reforestation, those sorts of things. And as you know, the years go on and issues change, it morphs into more relevant issues of today. There's a lot of issues right now on hydrological function, on watershed function, on restoration of native ecosystems, as well as global change issues. So that's where the, thing, the key is now. As a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to a nationwide um, experimental forest and range network. We're going to learn the updates from all of the other experimental forests to see um, how everything is going. And within um, Hawaii, what makes Hawaii sort of unique in this whole setup is that primarily experimental forests are located on national forests. And I don't know if you know it or not, but Hawaii does not have any national forests in the U.S. Forest Service system. So uh, it wasn't, I think this is why it wasn't developed long ago. And so 
the way that we do it here in Hawaii is we have a partnership with the state of Hawaii, who is our biggest sort of collaborator here in terms of what, how we uh, guide our research at our institute. Um, and so it's, a, it's an overlay of an experimental forest on existing uh, forest lands. And right now there's four jurisdictions that are overlap, overlaid with this experimental forest. There's a forest reserve, there's a natural area reserve system, um, and state park, and what is the fourth? Private landowners as well. So as you can see here, this is sort of our hierarchy. Um, our uh, parent station is actually in California, the Pacific Southwest Research Station. We're the Institute of Pacific Island Forest. We've been here in Hawaii since 1967, primarily serving the needs of the state of Hawaii as well as uh, nonprofits. And you can see that our jurisdiction, this is a map we like to show when people say how small Hawaii is. This is our jurisdiction, is across the US affiliated Pacific Islands. And if you look at the breadth, the geological breadth or geographical breadth of this, um, it's uh, definitely a, a pretty challenging task. And just to give you a little bit more background, um, this Hawaii experimental forest idea came out, started in 1992 with the Hawaii Tropical Forest um, Recovery Act. And I don't know if anyone in this room is familiar with that group, but this is essentially an act of Congress to, um, to maintain and, and manage the forest better in the state of Hawaii. And, Establishing an experimental forest was listed in that act as, as the state of Hawaii shall. And I think the word shall, if it's in that act, means that you're going to do it. And so it took a while for people to actually figure out how to do it because we didn't have national forests. Um, but then in 1994, there was a recovery action plan that was produced that again promoted the experimental forest. And it just sort of sat for a long time. And then we got a director in Boone Hoffman who really wanted to take this idea and run. So we started working with the state to figure out where would be good locations. And we wanted to encompass areas that sort of captured the relevant natural resource issues of Hawaii. And um, landscapes that sort of capture the breadth of gradients that we have in here in Hawaii, the rainfall gradients, the substrate age gradients, the land use change gradients. So um, we went through a pretty long process with DOPA to come up with these kinds of things. We also wanted proximity to communities so that we can share the research with communities and other natural resource managers. Um, and so finally in 2007, the AGTF was established with a cooperative agreement with the LNR. And then today we're just continuing to work through that process. We're developing management plans in these areas and really implementing a lot of activities, which I'll go over today. So as I mentioned, um, we tried to take advantage of a lot of different gradients that we have available to us in Hawaii for doing research. And so here are the two uh, HETF locations. Am I permitted to talk about bonus sign or bowl line? You are more <laughs> than you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> you got the, so I'll focus on the boy first, which is on Mauna Kea. Um, so this is a very wet forest. It's about a, a 5,000 hectare piece of land that encompasses a forest reserve and a natural area reserve. It's an absolutely beautiful rainforest if you've ever been up there. It's some incredibly tall trees, very healthy native forest. It's a very wet forest. And it spans an ele elevational gradient from, I believe, about uh, 800 feet here to close to 6,000 feet on this end. And then the other unit is over here on the other side, Kuvava. This is a, a very dry system. And then it's almost the entire um, Ahu Hua lie from almost up to the top here to the ocean, but not quite. So this is the forest bird sanctuary up in this portion. And that's an overlay of a very dry forest and um, a very a, a great mixture of land use, historic land use um, area. So there's really incredible native music forest. And then there's extensive grass lands of, of non-native grasses. So it's a really good area for looking at restoration of um, native dry forests. And just to um, talk a little bit more about um, how unique and, and great these areas are for research, I have some photos here. This is a, a really beautiful picture by Rob Schellenberger of uh, Puvava. You can see this people obey down here. And so there's the uh, ability to do sort of reach, bridge to reef or watershed research in these kinds of areas. 
there's a lot of endangered species in uh, both areas, plant species primarily in, um, in uh, Kumaba on the lower elevations with the bird sanctuary up high. Other bird species, this connects up with Hakala National Wildlife Refuge on the very top end of the Lapahoehoe unit. And there's lots of hydrological um, watersheds that can be studied. And I'll talk a little bit about more about forest dynamics. This is a big project that we're trying to, uh, that we have established here at Lapahoehoe and Kubapa. So the way this uh, is administered, as I mentioned, it's a little bit complex because it's not a national forest, so it's a partnership. And really the, the whole process is overseen by what we're calling the ATTF planning group. And this is a mixture of, of DOFA primarily. So the head of DOFA and the head of the Institute of Pacific Island Forestry sort of oversee that committee. And we meet quarterly to discuss all kinds of issues associated with the experimental forest. Um, it's open to anybody that wants to do research in the area. So if you guys have a project you're interested in looking at, you propose a study plan. Um, there's a proposal process. It's on the website, the ATTF website. And when, once that gets submitted, it goes to the research technical committee. So that's comprised of managers and scientists who make sure that, um, that it is sci sound scientifically, that it's not introducing any sort of um, impacts to the forest that we're not interested in. You know, we've definitely seen some of that where people want to do some pretty wacky experiments, bringing in cookie frogs and, you know, putting them up different elevations. And so we do a sort of vet for that, but really we're trying to encourage basic science as well as applied science. And primarily if you look at the kind of people that are doing research in this area, it's a lot of folks from the U.S. Forest Service, primarily the University of Hawaii, they're actually the biggest, um, um, have the most permits, as well as other universities across the U.S. And then we also have these um, community advisory councils. And these are really interesting. They're comprised of members of the adjacent communities that sort of either have a historical or cultural relationship to these landscapes, as well as other land managers. And you can see the kind of expertise that these community groups represent. And in fact, they seek out uh, these, this kind of expertise. And what these groups do is they get together and they, they are supposedly very well versed and understand the management plans of the area. And then they, as a group, sort of discuss and decide how to, to best use these landscapes for multi-use purposes. Because as you can imagine, you know, not research isn't everything here. You know, there's all kinds of activities going on. There's hunting, there's cultural activities, all kinds of things. And we want to make sure that everyone is agreeable, or at least for the most part agreeable. We can't always all agree on everything um, to these. So if any of you guys are interested to serve on any of these committees, these uh, advisory committees, we're always looking for members and really you just have to be interested in how these forests uh, function. So contact me afterwards if, if you're interested and I can help steer you in the right direction. Another thing that we're really interested in and very excited about is community engagement because I feel like a lot of communities don't really have access to a lot of our forest systems. And so we're really trying to promote that and we're really trying to promote um, education opportunities for sort of the next generation of people who are going to take care of our forests. So we're trying um, to really engage in many different ways. We have this Ulu Lehu Lehu, the Million Ohia initiative, working with a lot of school groups. Um, we, we always are presenting at Career Conservation Days. And then recently we had our first open house out of Mapahoy Hoi and it was a big success where you have, we had scientists there as a UH student who's uh, showing community members about how he's tracking rapid ohia death in the forest. So uh, he had a little drone there and everyone could sort of play with it. So these kinds of events, um, I think, are really um, sort of engaging communities. We're, we're hoping to get more sort of citizen science, citizen science type projects um, as well to help with monitoring and invasive species uh, work in these units. Uh, we have teacher workshops, so La Pahoy Hoi unit is really tightly associated with the La Pahoy Hoi community or charter school. And so we do a lot of different programs with them. Um, every kid in the park is a forest service um, initiative to try and increase children going or kids going out into natural areas. Uh, this Kiki Oka Aina is a pretty interesting project here. Here's Kealoha Guinea, who's a new scientist in our office, and he had a hunting competition. Uh, trying to sort of engage with the hunting community more so that, you know, we can 
to all work together on common problems. And so what he's doing right there is he's taking uh, soil samples off of the hook of the pig and he's going to run DNA or genetic analysis on it to see if there's um, ceramicistus spores for the uh, fungus that's affecting the causing rapid ovea death. And so, you know, then he reports back to the hunters about these activities. And I think it, this particular hunting permit, he didn't find anything on the, the hose of the pig. So it's really empowering the hunters to really, you know, be engaged in these kinds of activities. And then Ovia Love Fest, which just a little plug, I think it's this weekend at Uni Loa. So uh, if you're able to get over there, I think it should be a really good informative event. And then professional development, as I mentioned, really trying to train the next generation. Having an experimental forest has been really helpful for that. Um, we work a lot with Kupu. I don't know if you're familiar with that program, but they're really sort of have taken the lead in um, doing these sort of YCC youth conservation groups where we have uh, kids from 16 to 21 working in crews and helping with natural resource management issues. Um, we've had 11 teams since 2012 on the experimental forest. And then we have this uh, conservation leadership development program, which has several programs. It has an uh, eight-week program, a 10-month program, and we've had 54 members of those in 2012. Right now we have a year-round uh, member, Christian Erickson, and his, one of his goals is to help uh, with an HUTS sustainability plan. So it's, it's been a really uh, great relationship. And many of these kids and, you know, folks have gone on to have careers in, in conservation here in Hawaii. Um, these are some other programs that we have, the Conservation Service Corps, and then the IPIF Professional Internships. This is uh, primarily a program that uh, Becky Ostertag and I are working on together. And this is, you know, when kids, or I call them kids now, but when students graduate from college and get their degrees, they often don't have a lot of experience in natural resources. And so providing them opportunities to help us on some of our research really gives them an opportunity to get out, get that field work that they need and, and see if they actually really like that career. You know, it gives them an opportunity to then move on after that. And we've had uh, probably over a hundred of these come through um, and many of those work on the experimental forest. So now I'm gonna get into some of the more interesting stuff, um, the type of research that is going on here. And as I mentioned earlier, this is anyone can submit a research proposal that wants to work in these areas. And um, I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights from this year and past years as well. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, forest biomass and carbon. And this is led up by Greg Asner, um, Carnegie Airborne Observatory, is a, a technology that he developed using a, um, uh, an airplane with uh, LIDAR, which is an, an ability to get um, many, di lots of different information, but the information that I'm showing in this particular map here is uh, forest carbon. So it's a really unique way to go out on the landscape and look at biomass of the trees just by uh, having really sort of high resolution LIDAR capability. And so with this map here, I mean, as you can imagine, there's probably hundreds of months in the lab right here crunching data. But then eventually you do get to this type of map. And this is a map of height and biomass um, of the Lava Hoi Hoi unit. So the red colors indicate that the of, of tall trees and higher carbon. And the blue, oops, the blue um, here is low stature trees. And if you go out to this particular area, this is all boggy. So the, the trees are very short statured. So this has all been ground truth with people going out in the field and looking at this. So it's a really great way to look at our forests as they relate to climate, as they relate to substrate age and soil and all kinds of factors. And so you can see the tallest trees are right in here and, and we can vouch for that. We have a forest plot right in there that is in, in incredibly beautiful with tall trees. And then as you get lower down here, this is going more down into the sugar cane lands with some scattered trees. And up here you see this really kind of thin uh, level. If you it had a, a better image of this, you would see that that's even much darker than here. And what that is, is a stand of tropical ash that was planted uh, many years ago that has contributed to it a lot of carbon. So he's done this not only here in Lakahoi Hoi, but around many parts of the island. And they generated a carbon map, which is incredibly useful for 
um, sort of moving into the carbon economy and the carbon markets in Hawaii to have a really good value of um, getting these kinds of estimates. And similar to that project is another project that uh, Becky and I, Becky Ostertag and I, and UCLA scientists at the Forest Service are working on, and we call it HIPNET, which stands for Hawaii Permanent Plot Network. And what we're doing in this particular study is we're trying to understand how Hawaii's forests grow and die. So looking at sort of growth rates and mortality. And believe it or not, we don't have a good handle on that. There's been lots of research in forests in Hawaii and understanding how ecosystems work, but not really a long-term picture of how they change over time. And so uh, we, through XCOR funding many years ago, we started this project in 2008. And what this entails is going out to the forest, taking a big piece of forest that's representative of the species in that area, and measuring and marking and tagging every single stem that's greater than a centimeter, so you know, like your finger. And so it's a lot of work, and that's where all these professional interns, you know, got their, <laughs> their feet dirty out here on this project. And, um, but it's a, it's a really valuable data set because when you go out and re-census it, you can see what is, what is living, what is growing, what is dying. And um, we've established climate stations associated with each of these plots. We have uh, four of them around the island, one in uh, Kubaba and then one over in, uh, two in the Kubaba unit and then one at Palamanui, which is a drier forest. And, um, with located with the climate stations, then we can sort of look at how those dynamics um, relate to abiotic variable, variables such as climate. And it's, you know, a lot of people do this, are starting to do this with climate change, but we have a really unique and diverse system here. It's very tractable where we have species that are similar in all these units, um, but differ in, in climate. And then on top of that, as we all know, we have, even though we have patterns of seasonality here, we can have random weather any time of year. And sometimes we're in extended droughts and sometimes we're in extended rainy periods like we have in of late. And so we can actually relate that to the growth and mortality of these trees. And one of the things that was kind of a surprise to us recently that we started to notice is that when you look at the climate, and that's what this figure is up here, this is a the minimum temperature, and this is the month here on the bottom, and this is at, uh, these lines represent different years from 2013 to 2016. And what you can see is there's been this steady increase in the minimum temperature at night. And it, you see that it's happening in the summer months. And so what that means to ecologists is that if you look at release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's directly related to temperature. So the higher the temperature, the more CO2 the plant is going to respire at night. And what that does is it changes the balance of carbon um, in the, the, the functioning of the tree. So they're losing more carbon than they would normally if the temperatures were you know, more what they're, they're used to. And so they're showing this also in other places around the world, such as uh, La Selva in Costa Rica and other places that have long-term data. And then when we started to look at um, our, our changes in mortality, we noticed a trend that mortality increases as T min increases. So this is kind of a warning sign that um, as our climate increases, um, mortality rates of our trees are, could be increasing too. So this kind of data can be very valuable for us to understand how to move forward in managing our forests. Um, let's see, the next one I'm going to talk about is a um, field investigation of lava flows. And this is done by Thomas Shea at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And um, what they did is looked at the uh, um, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the lava flow composition at the Pubaba cone, which I believe is right here. And what they found is that it's a very unique substrate and it's a kind of what they call a true pumice or a glassy rock or obsidian. So if you go out there, you can actually find this. And it's incredibly beautiful and very different from the basalts that we're used to seeing in a lot of our other lava flows. So have you guys seen a Kubaha lava cone? Yeah. So maybe look for some of the city next time you're out there. 
And um, it's also a very different chemical composition, which is quite interesting. Um, and uh, now he's sort of moving over to another area over at Pu'uanakulu. You can see here, oh, no, this is Kubala, this is over at Pu'uanakulu, sorry. Um, to see if this, this substrate um, is a similar eruption to this substrate. So some interesting discoveries there. Uh, this is some research going back to Mauna Kea, or to Mauna Kea. this is at La Hoi Hoi. This is a uh, Hawaiian hoary bat habitat occupancy, and this is done by Frank Bonacorso at USGS. They've been studying bat, in the, bat um, they've been doing bat monitoring out there for many, many years. And I got the chance to go out there one night with them, and it was really incredible. They, we caught, so we probably caught like 27 bats, which was incredible. And I think it's one of the highest densities of bats. Um, um, on Hawaii Island. And so anyway, what they found here is that they have a bat density all year round. This is the month here and this is detectability. They're using, they have um, these detectors going up. This is Blair Road in Lapahoehoe. And then they're also mist netting as they go up there and catching them. And you can see that there's really different patterns of seasonality in the um, um, bat behavior and, and use of the forest really low during this time of year. And then where we are right now, uh, much higher um, observations of bats. And it looks like they found that there's this false warming, what they say. And this is where large numbers of uh, reproductively active males and females gather and um, mate in, these, in this location. And, and they've done uh, diet analyses and showing that they're mostly um, using moths and beetles during this site. So this has been a... Uh, a great area of research for them. Uh, now moving over to Kubaha, there's um, a, an incredible lava tube system over there where there's been all of these sort of cultural resources that have been found in these cave systems. Peter Bostead has been mapping extensively out there and um, it's amazing how much, how determined they are. These spelunkers are super into it and they go out and they are detailed maps of all of the caves, the entrances, the openings, everything. And to date, they've mapped more than eight miles of cave, and they've now determined that caves at Kubaba are actually more extensive than some of the cave systems in Puna that were thought to be some of the longest uh, caves. Um, in 2014, the relatively pristine and complete skeleton of Branta Ruax was found. This is a, a extinct Hawaiian goose. And um, you can see this is a picture of all of the, the geese um, in Hawaiian geese. And this is the nene here on the end here. So you can see in size, this is the one that they found here. This is the bone right here. So you can see these other ones are from other islands and are all now extinct as well. Uh, this is another um, interesting sort of find that is what happened at uh, both Lapahoehoe and Kuvala. This is um, distribution of Hawaiian, native Hawaiian bark beetles. I know we're hearing a lot about the non-native bark beetles right now. Um, this is done by Conrad Gillett at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he's been trapping and surveying bark beetles in both of the sites for both of the units at the HUTF. And he found six species of, of native Hawaiian bark beetles. And actually, one of them, uh, Xyloborus pele, is a species which has not been recorded since 1989, I'm sorry, 80, 1981, when it was described, and it, the last known collection was 89 years ago. So just getting people back onto the landscape and finding some of these things that haven't been seen for a long time, um, the experimental forest provides uh, these kinds of opportunities. Um, he's also finding species at Kubaba. And, but unfortunately, despite the sort of exciting um, revelation, there, you know, the, the, the non-native bark beetles are unfortunately much more extensive than these native ones. I'll, I'll go back to one of my research projects that um, is uh, primarily at Kubala and also Puakaloa training area. Um, here we've used the uh, high resolution imagery from Greg Asner that I showed you earlier. To, to, to generate a very high resolution digital elevation model to look at how topography on the landscape influences survival of, of native ecosystems in the forest and primarily endangered plant species. So we went out and flew the landscape, got this really incredible high resolution 
digital elevation map and came up with what we thought were good suitability criteria for plant populations. And when we thought about that, we thought of, you know, when you're out in the field and you're walking around, this is sort of the landscape, what it looks like, and you're in this area right here with the orange, you're getting blasted with wind, there's no soil, you know, it's not a really hospitable place for a plant. But right next to it, you know, this is a pretty fine scale topography. This is a, sort of on a downward facing slope. So when it rains, everything it sort of accumulates right there. It's away from the wind, the desiccating winds in these dry systems. And so we thought, well, perhaps this is a, a much better suitable place for plants. And so we, we went out and sort of did a, a model. And then if you had neither of those, if you had, um, if you were sitting up here, you have no benefit. So that's a zero. If you have just the, um, the sort of downward facing slope, you have a criteria of one. And if you're in a place protected from the wind and in a downward facing slope, you're a criteria two. So this would be the greatest habitat. So if you look across the whole landscape, it's highly varied. This is sort of a close up of how fine scale this is. You see that most of the landscape is in the zero and one category. And so, and then a very small proportion of it is in this two category. So if you're a, a land manager and you have endangered plants and you want to put them out in the ground, it's really important to know where you're going to put them. And so we, we did an experiment where we went out and planted plants in this habitat and in this habitat. And we had a statistically higher survival in the high, high suitability habitat. So it's a really valuable tool for land managers if they want to um, think about strategically working across their landscape. And um, a colleague, our former postdoc on this project, developed an extension in ArcMap. So anybody who wants to use this technology can download this um, extension. And if you have access to a digital elevation model, you can do this um, yourself. And then one of the longest term projects that's been going on in the experimental forest, way before the experimental forest was started, and actually way before the Tropical Forest Recovery Act even um, got established, uh, Peter Batusik, uh, who's actually a Hawaiian native, started working out here to um, look at what controls um, um, the development of soils and ecosystems and how that relates to vegetation. So he set up what he called a long substrate age gradient um, across going from volcano all the way out to Kauai. And La Pahoi, Hawaii is sort of in the middle of that gradient. He's been working out there for a very long time. Um, and the pro in the project, he wanted to look at what nutrients were limiting forest growth at the different ends of the spectrum. And then he started a large scale fertilization experiment where he added that limiting nutrient and looked at how the forest changed over time. And I'm not going to go into the, in, the, res, the main results on any of those, but I did want to point out that the, the main premise of, of the research goes across these six sites here, across the Hawaiian Islands here, starting very young soils here, old soils here out in Kauai. And this is nitrogen, this peak here, and then this, this is phosphorus, so phosphorus here, nitrogen here. And what you can see if you look down at La Pahoi Hoi, it's a sweet spot really on this gradient. So you have very high levels of nitrogen as well as very high levels of phosphorus. And these are the two most important nutrients for forest growth. Um, kind of really coming together here. And this is why we have the tallest forests basically in the state of Hawaii in this location uh, because of that. And you can see on the other ends of the spectrum, you have depletion in either one nutrient or another. So starting out in really young, you have low phosphorus and low nitrogen because it's just rock basically. And then when you go out to uh, Pokei, again, you have all of the phosphorus has been tied up and locked up. And so you have um, limiting resources on that end as well. So this has been a classic experiment that is cited by everybody across the world really in terms of how forests function related to these nutrients. And a lot of this research is from multiple And I think this is the final one I'm going to talk about. This is, a, again, on Guala Lai. Sorry, Fritz. Um, <laughs> this is over at the Kiholo Bay area at Kubala. Many of you have probably seen the Kiabe over there and seen what a problem it is. Um, it's 
really loves it in, in these leaf, uh, leeward slopes um, in, in Hawaii, especially on the coastal areas. And so there was a project to sort of um, understand if the, the use of water by these trees, because they use a lot of water, and the release of nitrogen because they're nitrogen fixers, um, how that impacts our native plants and animals. Uh, most likely not good, right? So they went out and did a number of experiments. Again, they used the Carnegie, Carnegie Airborne Observatory, and you can look at the biomass here. This, oops, I'm sorry. This is a, the, the Kiholo Bay here, and you can see the green associated here with biomass. Those are the biggest, tallest, largest trees here. And as you go inland, this is the highway, I believe. Um, as you go inland, you can see that the stature of the, the Kiabe trees is much lower. So notice that next time you're down there. And they looked at how that's happening, and they used isotopes, traced isotopes through uh, the Kiabe trees, and found that the proportion of water that they use is based on the water table um, down by the coast. So this is the coastal area. This is the groundwater contribution that's found in the stems. And you can see the tallest trees are using, are actually tapping directly into the groundwater. And as you move up slope, you see that they're really not able to access it, that water. So the short stature is related to the fact that they're just having to take advantage of the rain like every other plant. So um, really um, interesting study to, to see how the Kiabe spreads across the landscape. And good to know that, that actually um, the depth of the water table is actually limiting the spread of the species. So those are just some highlights of the type of research that's going on, and um, it's pretty exciting to get to read all these proposals that come in. We also have facilities that are available for researchers and educational activities. Uh, we have purchased a piece of land in the Lapahoyoe community, and this is where we host the Kahikina Learning Center. Um, and then we're using existing facilities at Hubaba together with the state uh, different houses and we're um, hoping to invest funds to improve these structures um, out at Kubaba. And you can see that um, this is the number of participants and this is a uh, Kubaba here and La 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 Hoi Hoi here. Pretty low numbers here. We're trying to change that number with the sustainability plan that we're developing. And Kubaba has become very popular for many, many activities. This is just a timeline of our 10 year, um, just some highlights. I don't expect you to go through these, but um, we put this out to sort of remind our friends out there um, about uh, what's going on. And if anybody wants more information on the HPF, uh, please you know, feel free to contact me. And we are also trying to solicit volunteer activities. So hopefully you can get engaged if you're interested. Um, just the plug for this run for the dry forest. It's Saturday, October 27th. And there's a 5K and a 10K and a Kiki walk run. The plant featured this year is Ohia Legua. So it'll be a really nice t-shirt. And um, if you're interested in conservation projects, Ohana Days at Kubaba, it's always the last Saturday of the month. And uh, coming soon, we're going to be starting some Ohana days at the Lapahoi Hoi as well. So with that, I'd like to just end and thank you for coming and learning about the experimental forest. And um, if you have any questions, and if you want more information, feel free to just be known. Thanks a lot. Um, there's been, I think, three instances found in Lapahoi Hoi. Um, it's been the, if you know the varieties, there's two varieties, the Luko Ohia and the Huli Ohia. The Luko Ohia is the more devastating one. There's, uh, that's been found in Lapahoi Hoi as well as the Huli Ohia. In Kubaba, so far, there's been nothing to date. And that's the danger is that it's not going to get there. Um, some recent evidence, recent research is showing that there appears to be strong correlation with the presence of Paratocystis, which is the fungus, um, and fence units for conservation. So it may be some of the animals are starting to wound the trees and have sort of an effect of getting into the trees. So this is some research that's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, so
So you showed the slide where you related temperature to tree mortality. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that reminded me of a study I heard of recently where they were in Puerto Rico and they collected insects and insects who were referred and compared those numbers to numbers they collected in the 70s. Oh. So I wonder if anyone was doing any, any long term studies like that here with particularly with insects. No, I mean, that's what we're trying to encourage as many as long term studies. The problem with long term studies is everybody wants the data, but to do them, thankless job and it's really hard to get funding for monitoring um, which is really critical to get that information so um, we don't have data um, I mean I know Fritz they're starting to do a lot of long-term monitoring on my and if you can see the effort it takes to do that especially for insects you know there's a lot to deal with but no unfortunately we don't have that kind of data Is uh, La Hoi Hoi Forest open to the public at all? It's open to the public, but there's no road to be able to hike in. <coughs> yeah. So that's one of the things we'd like to improve is uh, the trail going in. It's pretty bad. It's strawberry lava, and it's not very fun to walk through. So that's one of the Ohana days that we want to get started is improving the trail access for people to get up into the forest. I guess uh, along the lines of what we were mentioning at, at the outset, I'm just curious on your thoughts on sort of balancing the community concerns about research versus the, the, the you know, how conflict, how challenging and difficult you make it for permitting research for, from the research side of it. Are you, yeah, sort of what you're doing to help both the research, promote the research, but at the same time address community concerns. Yeah, that's, that's a balance that we all like to find the sweet spot for that because it is challenging. You know, they're not always compatible uses. Um, but I think that there's always common um, concerns that we have. And I think trying to find those commonalities and then starting to work together on developing dialogue and trust and relationships, I think are the most important things. So I think really finding those common um, Things that we share, like I know out of La Hoi Hoi, it's invasive species. Um, you know, the hunting community really is not liking the strawberry guava and the clydenia because it makes it really hard to get out into the forest. And we don't want it there because it's impacting the health of the native forest. So coming together on those kinds of activities and then having dialogue, you know, I mean, these multi use landscapes, you know, you look at like the suitability map, you know, some areas are better for protecting than others. And really trying to find, you know, for, for like rare plants or something, and that forest might be fine for, you know, um, you know, having animals and forests sort of coexist together. So really, sort of looking at the landscape and quantitative ways. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, <laughs> Mars has fenced in different areas of the mm -hmm. forest. Mm -hmm. um, has it proved? Has it been proved that it's really protecting? I know it's protecting from the undulants, but we have a lot of invasive plants, and fencing is one thing compared to going in and pulling the plants out or invasive species one way or another, bugs or mm -hmm. insects. Have you heard anything? Is, is, is it improving anything because it's been fenced up? I brought that up because of how the hunters have, um, you know, it's an issue with them. Sure. And when you mentioned hunters, I thought, yeah, we've got fencing around different places. Is it really proving that we're having success? There has been a this? lot of evidence, a lot of data to show the success of fenced units in protecting native biodiversity. And there's been other data that shows that fenced units, the health of the forest is better, of the native forest. But in some situations, you know, that may not be true. So if you look at you know, if you're fencing out, if you're fencing out ungulates that are also controlling invasive species, then by fencing it in, you're going to have more invasive species issues, and that has been shown in some ecosystems. So, you know, just fencing alone is not an answer. If you're going to fence, you still got to manage. You still got to manage these forests. So, um, it, it's not an end all for everything, and so. Um, I, I'm a proponent, I mean, personally, they, some areas do need to be fenced because they can't coexist with animals. We have these incredibly rare invasive plants that are 
are like ice cream to many of our non-native species. But in other areas, I think that there could be active hunting programs where you can actually reduce the numbers enough to um, have healthy forests in those areas as well. So I, I think your point that we can all come together on. But the evidence is out there that sensitivities are important for aspects of nature, preserving and conserving the environment. Um, does that help your question? Yeah, yeah. it does. We know NARS and, yeah. and their fishing and yeah. always admire yeah. that activity because it's very you know, intense. Um, and I know they're doing some managing, but that when they're fencing, it's miles of it, acres of it. Um, and you have five people and they're right. in different spots around the island. And how do you manage that? You, know, you need a, a good volunteering system yeah. or um, a lot of uh, staff members. Right. Right? So, we're wondering how that was really working after the number of years of listening or, or learning. Uh, some of my friends worn out and being held confident out. Yeah. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, kind of neat, but no, I don't want to put a fence up. But, <laughs> <laughs> oh. but um, what are isotopes? And you're saying that there was an area that they were looking oh. at and having to the isotopes. The I don't see no isotopes of like the radiation kind of thing for treatments or something. What no, it's that? like there's natural abundance isotopes. Where, yeah, where they're at a certain rate in the ecosystem, and we can use those sort of as tracers to understand how things move in and out of, of animals and plants. And so they're really great tools because it's, it's the data is very black and white. You know if it's there or not there. And so it's not like a radioactive. Yeah, when you said that, I thought, yeah, what are you I know I should have. I should have put up in that area. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, people do use those kinds of tracers as well, you know, for different things, and they are really valuable. But you know, we don't want to definitely put anything in the ecosystem that you know, don't want to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if trees ever get harvested and used as permanent forests. Certainly, yeah. I mean, this one is not it's not something we're interested in in Hawaii, um, but. There is a lot of uh, experimental forest where it's it's primarily looking at fuels reduction for fires. No, I, I mean here. Yeah. Oh, in Hawaii, no, no, there's no. Because I'm I'm interested in tropical ash at the top of the rock. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to harvest 30, it? Thousand year, you know, there's some huge amount of trees. You said this. Yeah. There's very big carbon yeah. sequestration is great. When those trees die and fall over, I guess that carbon just goes back. To yeah. The yeah. yeah. I, I don't know, maybe come up with a proposal with Dopa. I would love that. <laughs> they might be interested to get rid of them because they are actually spreading. For a long time, they didn't think they were spreading, but we're starting to see it encroach down. Yeah. Hello. Um, a number of years back, I was um, Christian Torres Sherpa. We were trapped around uh, Prince Adrian 22 in the Pacific. He was doing. Uh, Combination vector studies on an ancient plant. Do you remember what that was about? Or is there any results around that? Because I'm just curious about that. Oh, yeah, they are still doing that research. Um, that's someone out of our office, Christina Liang, and uh, studying the pollination of some rare plants. And as you, su as you would su expect, that many of these rare plants aren't being pollinated effectively as they take off the pollinators. <coughs> So there's still non-native pollinators that are sort of partially doing the job, but um, it's they're not really work, it's not working at its full potential at all. So pretty much all of the species are looking at this as an story. Remember going up to Bob Ross and it's an experimental place to teach the way these things are it's like how sort of different kind of pollination is going on in plants. It's just yeah, so few plants and not the right pollinators. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for coming.